Welcome to the online public hearing for the I-15 Springville to Spanish Fork Interchange Environmental Assessment. We appreciate those who have logged in. We do want to take a little bit of time to allow people to connect. So I'm going to go through a series of instructions. First of all, I want to go over the format of our meeting. And if you miss anything, we'll be repeating things, reminding you throughout. I also can see that we're getting comments. Uh, coming in through the chat feature, I should say questions coming in through our chat feature, and I have seen some verbal comments coming in already through um, our online recording that we'll play back in the second half of the meeting. So here shortly, we will jump into our presentation. Uh, we've got a formal presentation to go through and give you an overview of the study. At 645, we will jump into our open mic portion of the meeting where we will play back the voice recordings that have been come in or that have come in throughout the meeting. And then also wanna remind you that we're in the middle of our comment period and we'll be soliciting and um, looking for comments to be submitted through November 13th. Um, while we wait for the presentation to start, just a few things that you guys can do. First and foremost, you can look for information on this site or on our website. Uh, there is a tab below the video screen that has the environmental assessment and all of our supporting documents. You're welcome to look at those as we wait for people to log on and, and we get started. Also, please sign into the meeting. I'm um, in that same area, the tab on the left, there is a sign in feature. Please click that and sign in. If there are multiple people signing in from a household, uh, please put multiple names in that name box. It will accept those. It will only allow one email though to go into the email box. And then just below the sign in area, and we'll show this again here in a minute, there, is, there are some demographic questions. If you're comfortable filling those out, please do so. Uh, this helps us comply with our federal Title VI guidelines. Um, we'll get started shortly. I can see the questions coming in. Looks like some answers as well that are being worked on. And I can see that some voicemails have been recorded. So if you have questions, um, you can post them to the right of the video screen and the chat box. And we do have people um, available and ready to respond to those. Uh, if you can't see that, you may have um, enlarged your video screen. If you can shrink that down, um, you should be able to see the chat box on the right. Again, we have a team of people that are working on responses. We're going to try to respond to as many of those as we can tonight. And we will be accepting and responding to those throughout um, the duration of the meeting. We, um, if we don't get to it, we will be posting those on our website sometime next week. So we'll continue to work on answers that we may not get to. Our hope is we get to as many as we can tonight, but if we aren't able to, you can look for those on our website. And if for some reason you feel like we weren't, we didn't answer your question or you would like to ask your question to somebody in person, you can always email us or call us. We have a dedicated hotline for the study, which is 801-704-0899, or you can email us at i15 Springville Spanish Fork at utah.gov. Uh, questions submitted through the chat, just to clarify, are not considered comments. They will not go in the final EA, which will be published in January. It's sometime in early 2021. Um, but we will try to answer your questions. If you would like to leave um, comments. There's multiple ways to do that. The first way uh, would be verbal comments. We'll be taking verbal comments tonight. I can see that some people have already taken advantage of that. It looks like there's two already in there. At 645, we will go to the, what, what I would call the open mic portion of our meeting, um, and we will play those recordings into the meeting for all the participants to hear. We will not respond to those tonight. Um, but we will be including those in the document and we'll be responding to those when it publishes in January. So just some quick instructions to leave a verbal comment. Just make sure you mute your computer speakers. It's all, it's kind of like calling into a radio station. When you call in, you can hear both going and there is a little bit of a time lag between what's happening real time and what you may be seeing on your screen. Um, you can dial the number 855-925-2801 and enter code 974. And press star for more options and then press two. Make sure that you uh, state your name clearly. And if you could spell it for us, that would be excellent. It'll help us get it correct in the record. You'll have up to three minutes to leave a message. And then again, we'll play those back uh, later on in the meeting. The voice recordings that are played and left with us will be transcribed and put in the document and they are considered 
uh, formal verbal comments, and we will respond to those into the document, but we will not respond to those um, tonight. So you can chat with us if you have some questions that you would like answered, you can leave a verbal comment. And the last thing I wanna talk about is written comments. Um, we are excited to get your input. There's been a lot of effort that has gone to this document. We wanna make sure that um, we hear from you. If there are areas of concern or things that you think we may have missed, please send us a comment uh, so that we can address it. There's three ways to send in a written comment. If you choose not to leave a verbal comment tonight, you can email us at our email address, i 15 springville spanish Fork, utahgov You can visit our website and on our website, we have an interactive map where you can go and spatially place your comment. You put a dot on the map and then attach a comment to it. That might be helpful if you want to talk about a specific area or a specific question that you have. And the last way would be to send us something through the US Postal Service. And we have an address there on the screen. All of these things are also available below in the how to comment tab. So please make sure you get those in to us. And um, we want to make sure that we respond into in the document when it's published in January. Now, normally we would meet in a gymnasium or a city hall or a library, and we would talk to you face to face. And given the current pandemic, we're not able to do that. And so we're doing the best we can to mimic that. But the format's a little bit different. It's new for all of us. It's new for us as well as I imagine it's new for you. But what we're trying to do, we talked a little about the chat. That would be like standing around a map and talking to a person face to face. Um, we're, we're trying to do some back and forth, some dialogue. So if you get a response to a question that you post in the chat and you have a follow-up question, don't hesitate to post that. We'll do our best. And, and again, that would mimic the back and forth dialogue you would get in a public meeting. The verbal comments that I've already talked about would be a lot like an open mic where you step up to a mic and you voice your comment for the study team, for UDOT, as well as all the members of the public that are participating to hear. And so there are some things that are somewhat familiar, but it's all just a little bit different. On the screen, you can see kind of the layout and the format for the meeting. So between um, 6 and 6.45, we'll be presenting. From about 7.40 or 6.45 to 7.30, we will have um, the open mic where we play back. When um, below this this screen, you can see the video screen that hopefully you're watching. That's where we're presenting from. Next to it on the right is the chat box. You can see there's a number of chats already in there. If you have questions, don't hesitate to ask them. If you have a follow-up question to something you may see or read, please make sure you get it in there. Uh, below the video are a number of tabs we wanna go to. The first tab is on the left. It's to prompt you to sign in. Uh, when you click it, a drop down will happen. You can see right there where your name is. If there's multiple people joining from one computer, please put all the names in that box. It will accept more than one. Just below that though is an email. The email is important, especially if you leave a comment. That's how we'll respond to you to let you know that the document has been published in January. Um, if multiple people are joining from one computer and they would all like a notification, you're only allowed to enter one email here. You'll have to go to our website or just send us an email and ask to be added and we can add you to our database and we will reach out to you when it's published. The following tab to the right is where the actual environmental document, the EA and all supporting materials are located. Um, all the information that we're presenting tonight can be found here as well as some additional information. And so if any time you have a technical difficulty we're recording this meeting and you can watch it at a later date, but you can also go to this tab or to our website to see all the information that we're going through tonight. The tab right of that is how to submit a comment. We've already hit on these, but um, this would give you clear instructions on how to provide a verbal or a written comment and ways that you can do each of those. Tonight is really the only night to provide a verbal comment, but you can provide written comments um, through November 13th. And the last one, is a post-event survey. I mentioned this is new for us. We're doing the best we can. We think we have a pretty good format in place, but please tell us, give us some feedback. What could we do better? We're trying to learn. Uh, we've hosted a few of these meetings already in this format, but we are trying to learn and get better. And if you would take a few minutes and just provide some input and some feedback to us, that would help us as we move forward on other projects, um, trying to share information with the public.
want to do some quick introductions now um, and talk a little about the, the purpose of the meeting. Uh, my name is Bo Hunter. I'm the public information manager for this project. Tonight, I'll also be joined by Darren Bunker, the UDOT project manager, Ryan Pitts, the engineering and environmental consultant, Elisa Alberry, UDOT environmental program manager, and there are a number of people working behind the scenes to respond to your chat. We also, if we have any downtime um, after the presentation or during the uh, open mic portion of the meeting, we will go to some frequently asked questions and we have some additional panelists that will join us to answer those. I wanna talk a little bit about the purpose of the meeting. Um, we're here really just to present information about this environmental assessment and the results. There's been a lot of work that has gone into this. We've looked at a lot of different alternatives and wanna make sure that everybody understands kind of what we've looked at and how we got to the preferred alternative. Preferred alternative. We also wanna make sure that we get your input. Input's important. We've talked about the questions through chat. Please submit questions. If you have comments that you want to go in the record, you can call in and leave a voice message or you can send us an email or send us a letter. We are looking for input and that is very important to us. I mentioned earlier, just as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, if you joined a few minutes after the hour and missed some of the intro, you can always go back and watch the recording. Um, also, I will go over a lot of this information multiple times as we move throughout the meeting. I want to go ahead and turn the time over to our UDOT project manager, uh, Darren Bunker, and he's going to give us a high level overview of the study. Hey, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, as you can see, our team has been working pretty hard to get to this point of the project. And we believe that the information we're gonna be presenting tonight will help answer many of your questions. And it may even spur uh, additional thoughts and uh, questions that you may need to reach out to us. And, and we're happy to communicate with you throughout this process. And as Bo mentioned, uh, the, the public uh, input process is open till uh, November, the middle of November. Uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank the project team that put many hours into preparing for this, uh, especially working through the, the technology issues and, and preparing to do this uh, over the internet instead of in person. Uh, we, we surely would like to uh, be with you in person instead. Um, give you a little bit of an overview here of this uh, process. UDOT has prepared an environmental assessment or an EA in part to comply with the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, and during this process, we want to evaluate a new interchange or the possibility of one uh, in the Springville and Spanish Fork area at 1600 South and 2700 North. Along with that, uh, we will be looking at improvements along the 1600 South, 2700 North corridor which I'll refer to uh, from this point on just as the corridor. Uh, the picture on the right-hand side of this graphic illustrates the study area that uh, we have looked at. On I-15, uh, the study area goes from the US-6 interchange on the south side up to the 400 south interchange in Springville on the north side. And from east to west, we go from uh, State Street over to SR50, or I'm sorry, over to Main Street on the west. So that's our study area. Um, the study area at Main Street and SR51, we've chosen those limits because these are major crossroads. In addition, we used a traffic sensitivity study based on 2050 traffic volumes to analyze where the traffic flows would potentially taper off at that time frame. The, this traffic study found that traffic levels taper off at State Street. So this indicates that strict State Street is a natural and acceptable endpoint for these project improvements. Um, talk, I'll talk a little bit about the environmental process and the schedule at this point. In 2019, the environmental study began with scoping, which is the period that UDOT identifies issues within the study area and solicits input from the public, state, and federal agencies, including uh, Native American tribes. This public scoping meeting was held in November of 2019. Since the scoping meeting, uh, the study team has taken feedback that we have received and used it along with other engineering studies to identify a range of issues, 
and to develop a purpose and need for this project. In other words, a building an interchange at this location was not a foregone conclusion. From there, we developed and refined potential alternatives and engaged with property owners, cities, stakeholders directly affected by the proposed improvements. The alternative development process and screening process will be discussed later on in the presentation. The impacts to numerous environmental resources were analyzed as well. And for each alternative, the results were compi compiled along with previous information into an environmental assessment. Next, I'd like to talk about the purpose and need for the project. Uh, we have identified for this project uh, a few needs along I-15. First is the, um, that in 2050, delays occurring during the PM commute hours at the 400 South interchange will result in congestion along I-15. That congestion in turn will create a queue which will be approximately about a half a mile long onto I-15, uh, the traffic going southbound at the 400 South off-ramp. And this condition creates a very unsafe uh, condition as you can imagine. Uh, the next two needs occur along the corridor, uh, the 1600 South 2700 North corridor. On this corridor, there are two at grade railroad crossings. Uh, these cr crossings uh, create a safety hazard because as trains stop, the queues along this corridor will uh, continually increase. And some of these trains stop for 20 to 30 minutes uh, as they're doing their work uh, and offloading. Uh, uh, cars. There's also a lack of pedestrian and bicycle facilities in this study area. The Mountain Land Association of Governments Regional Transportation Plan includes a planned multi-use path along this entire corridor uh, throughout this study area. As a result of the needs that I've just described, we have developed three purposes to be analyzed as part of this EA. The first need is to reduce the delay at the Springville 400 South interchange onto mainline I-15. Second, we want to identify an alternative that will improve the safety on mainline I-15 and also along the corridor. And a third need or purpose of, of this uh, study is to provide bike and pedestrian improvements within the study area. Now I'll turn the time over to Ryan, the engineering consultant, and he will present alternatives, uh, the alternatives that we developed in the screening process. Thanks, Darren. It's good to be with everyone tonight. Uh, as Darren previously stated, we prepared this environmental assessment as part of the National Environmental Policy Act. And with our purposes defined, then our team stepped forward and began to develop alternatives. We of course looked at a no action alternative and also several build alternatives. Note that the no action alternative does not include any roadway improvements within the study area through the year 2050. This alternative is primarily used as a basis for comparison to the build alternatives. But as a team, we developed several build alternatives or options to address the transportation needs for the study area. We first began by looking at a new interchange on I-15 and we evaluated two options. The first option we evaluated is a diamond interchange, which is very similar to the existing Spanish Fork Main Street interchange. This type of interchange has intersections at the ends of both of the off ramps. Another option we evaluated was a single point urban interchange or a SPUI. And this is similar to the existing Springville 400 South interchange. A SPUI interchange has one intersection at the center of the interchange. Of course, building a new interchange at this location on I-15 would increase future traffic along the east-west corridor and would cause congestion and safety concerns. So we also looked at improvements along the corridor. These options included widening the corridor to the north, 
Um, we also looked at widening the corridor to the south. And then we also looked at widening the corridor to the north in some areas and to the south in other areas in an effort to try to minimize the impacts to the existing properties. We called this option the meander option. So with options for an interchange and options for the corridor, we then narrowed down the options through a screening process. The first level of screening was identified as level one, and this screening was to determine if the options met the purpose and need of the study. The next level of screening was to determine the amount of impacts that would occur to key environmental resources. Specifically, we looked at wetlands, the number of relocations that would occur, and the amount of right of way that would be required. The final level of screening that we used was only applied to the interchange options. Uh, this screening looked at how well the interchanges performed, how much the interchange would cost to construct, and how well the interchange could serve traffic needs beyond 2050. So for the interchange options, both of the options met the purpose and need. Both had similar environmental impacts, operational results, and costs. However, the SPUI option would serve traffic needs beyond 2050. So we moved it forward for a detailed analysis. For the corridor options, all of those options, the north, south, and meander, all of them met the purpose and need. However, the meander option resulted in fewer relocations and re re would, require, uh, would require less right-of-way acquisition compared to the other corridor options. Therefore, we carried the meander option forward for detailed analysis. The SPUI option for the interchange and the meander option for the corridor were then combined into what we call the build alternative. In addition to the build alternative, we have the no action alternative, like I mentioned, and is included in the study and is primarily used as a comparison tool. So for this environmental assessment, UDOT has identified the build alternative of the SPUI and the meander as the preferred alternative, which has been evaluated in this EA. I, I now want to review all of the elements that are included in the preferred alternative. So the preferred alternative includes constructing a single point urban interchange at 1600 South or 2700 North. It includes realigning the frontage roads that are there today in order to accommodate the new interchange. It, it also includes adding one additional lane southbound and one additional lane northbound on I-15 between this new proposed interchange and the existing US-6 interchange. One thing to remember or to take note of is that the southbound lane would need to be barrier separated from the rest of the southbound traffic from the proposed new interchange all the way down to US-6 due to safety concerns. The preferred alternative also includes building a new bridge over what will be the combined Sharp and Tintic railroad tracks and modifying some of the existing accesses to the adjacent properties. Finally, the preferred alternative includes widening 1600 South, 2700 North of five lanes. This includes two travel lanes in each direction and a 14 foot center median. The widening also includes 10 foot shoulders on both sides of the road, a six foot sidewalk on the north side and a 10 foot multi-use trail on the south side of the road. For more details about the preferred alternative, we have created a 3D rendering of what the preferred alternative would look like. And we also have a detailed preferred alternative map. And both of these items are located on our study website or below this presentation under the EA supporting materials tab. I would encourage everyone to take a few minutes later tonight or, or sometime during this public comment period to review the preferred alternative in greater detail. Uh, I think it will help you understand some of the things that we're proposing a little bit better than just this presentation. 
Now, if selected, the preferred alternative would likely be constructed in phases over time. And later in the presentation, Darren will discuss a little bit about the possible construction phasing. At this time, I'm going to turn the time over to Elisa, the UDOT Environmental Program Manager, and she will now discuss the key environmental resources that were evaluated in the EA. Thanks, Ryan. Um, as as uh, both Darren and Ryan um, have talked about, we prepare an environmental assessment to comply with the National Environmental Policy Act, and that's also known as NEPA. And as part of NEPA, we are required to look at numerous environmental resources within what we've defined as our study area. Shown on the slide here are um, some of the resources that we did look at for this area. We've just highlighted them here. Um, and I want to point out that for all of the resources that we've looked at, we look, uh, we consider the impacts associated with them, including positive impacts or what, you know, what we would commonly call as a benefit. And we look at both the impacts for the no build or the no action alternative, as well as the preferred alternative. Some of the resources that we looked at, um, and I don't want to go through everyone here, but um, just because I know that you guys can read this slide, but we looked at existing and future land uses in the area, what the, what the changes may be associated with air quality, would there be any changes to the visual aspects of the area? In other words, if I'm driving down the road, does it, does it look dramatically different? Or if I live along this road, does it look you know, different whether I'm stationary or moving through the project area? Um, one thing I'll just point out is while we just have these little snippets of information that we're providing with you tonight, there's a ton of detail on all of these resources listed on the slide, as well as all the others that we looked at. Those are gonna be found in chapter three of the EA. Um, and then just to touch back on some of the other sections that we've covered in our presentation, when Darren was talking about purpose and need, that's gonna be found in chapter one. And then the alternatives development and screening process that Ryan touched on would be in chapter two. Now what I'd like to do is focus on several of the resources that um, we think are really important to people in this area um, based upon the impacts that we have analyzed as well as topics that were brought up during the scoping meeting. So the first resource that I'd like to touch on <clears throat> are the um, a uh, number of right-of-way impacts and um, re relocations that we're going to have throughout our study area. So when we did our analysis and we um, put together the preferred alternative design, we have calculated that there will be approximately 35 acres of land that are going to be impacting 63 different parcels. And this includes minor partial acquisitions as well as full property acquisitions. There are going to be two commercial properties that are potentially needing to be relocated. And within those two parcels, um, there are three businesses located. The other um, impacts that we're gonna have associated with right away are changes to business access. And so by constructing the bridge over the railroad um, crossing along the east-west corridor, there are gonna be some impacts to businesses there. Those would occur largely in the commercial area. Um, if you look on the right-hand side of your slide there, um, impacts to the commercial area access around 1700 West, just north of the corridor, as well as um, businesses that are adjacent to the railroad, the Sharp Railroad on the south side of 1600 South. Now, throughout this environmental process, we have been in contact with um, the property owners that we thought we would impact, and we have already notified them um, that they would have impacts either to their, the land that they own or to the businesses that are run in that area. Um, we do communicate with any impacted property owners on a case-by-case -case basis, so we would contact you individually. And we just would like to point out that if we have not contacted you yet, then we are not currently anticipating any impacts to your property. Um, as we move this project uh, forward, and I'll talk a little bit about the schedule in just a second, um, we may, when we get to the final design stage, refine our um, 
our preferred alternative here. Um, that may require some shifting, and and as a result of that, we may discover additional impacts. And if we impact a parcel there that we have not identified yet, we are still going to reach out with you directly. Um, to provide a little bit of assurance, though, if you do have questions about the, the right-of-way acquisition process or you just want to verify that you are or are not impacted, you're welcome to contact the study team. And I believe that information is posted on the project website. And then Bo will go over that information again at the end of the presentation. Uh, the next resource that I want to talk about are bicyclists and pedestrians. And this, um, we know that this area is important, in particular to bicyclists that came up as a comment during our scoping meeting. And so we've, we formulated as part of our purpose and need to create uh, bike ped facilities throughout this area. We knew that that was important. Um, and it's, it's also identified on the uh, long range plan from Mountain Land Association of Governments. So what we're proposing to do, and, and Ryan has touched on this a little bit, but we just wanted to call out and maybe show some detailed pictures here of what you could envision uh, the corridor would look like if you were to be a user, a non-vehicle user here. So we are planning to construct a 10 foot multi-use trail on the south side of 1600 South. And that's going to go the full length of the east-west corridor. So it will go from Main Street on the west of I-15 all the way over to State Street and um, terminate there where 1600 South connects with State Street. And that uh, multi-use trail is going to be made of asphalt. The other thing that we are planning on doing is having a continuous six foot sidewalk throughout the corridor. So what we have currently are kind of bits and pieces of sidewalk and we are proposing to redo and connect those all together so that it's a continuous uh, sidewalk for, for people here to use. One thing that I'd like to point out is that the multi-use trail will be um, constructed ultimately as part of the full build out of the project um, that's not going to occur until phase three. And Darren is going to talk about the construction phasing in just a little bit. So that'll give you a better sense for the timing of when that would occur. The last resource that I want to talk about is um, noise. And this tends to be a, a resource that people are very passionate about, myself included. Um, and so I just wanted to touch on this a little bit because it can, noise can have some of the most impactful um, changes to, to residences um, and, and people, really people who live in those residences, right? So um, we did do a noise study in this area. And on average, we have found that there is going to be a two decibel noise level increase throughout the study area. The maximum increase is going to be six decibels over the current conditions. And um, that max would be about 67 decibels. Now, one thing that's um, maybe a little tricky to understand about noise, it's like, well, how much louder is that? And so the human ear can detect about three to five decibels in it before they can um, experience a change. And so when we have a maximum of six decibels, you're really just starting to notice what those changes would be. So it'd be just slightly louder than what you would currently perceive if you were, if you were out, you know, say in your backyard in this area. So we did identify 23 noise, two, excuse me, 233 noise receptors throughout the study area. And um, of those, we found that only 12 residences, and these are uh, the residences that are along 1600 South, that they would experience impacts. And um, so what we are proposing to do here to mitigate those noise impacts is to construct a noise wall. And that wall would be six feet tall. And it would go from, if you can look at the, the graphic on the right-hand side of your slide there, it would go from 950 West. There'd be a wall constructed in two parts. It would stop at 1075 and then pick up again across the street and go to the end of where those residences are. Now, one thing that um, I 
I think people are like, well, how do we know if we are absolutely going to get a noise wall or how do I get to vote on a noise wall? Those types of things are really common questions that people have. And it's important to note that because we're planning on um, constructing a noise wall or we've stated that we would construct a noise wall, we still need to go through the final design process to make sure that the wall that we're proposing still meets the requirements um, in terms of like how much abatement or how how much can that wall bring down the noise? Um, can we construct it? And does it still meet the cost criteria that we have to comply with? So if it goes through all of those steps and we check those boxes, then we move on to the balloting phase. And the way balloting works is we would mail a ballot to the property owners and residents who are directly adjacent to this wall or who would receive a benefit, in other words, a five decibel reduction in noise. And once we mail those ballots out, we then need to receive 75% of those ballots back and 75% of those returned ballots need to be in favor of the wall. They need to vote yes. And so if you get the 75 and 75, which if you're following along with the math is the equivalent of 50% of overall people being in favor, then we would construct that noise wall. Uh, the last thing that I wanna to touch on is the um, kind of where we are in the process. So we've been talking a lot about the environmental phase, but then where does that fit in the overall grand scheme of things? So as Bo mentioned, we are in the formal comment period for the environmental study. This comment period began on October 13th and it will last until November 13th. So that means that if you're gonna submit a written comment, you need to do that by November 13th. Um, we also have, uh, we have the, pro the environmental assessment posted on our project website. You can either get to, to that through the project website or you can get through the portal that you're using tonight through publicinput.com. There's a tab associated with that. And for those of you that don't want to look at it electronically, we also have hard, a few hard copies that are available that you can make an appointment by contacting the project team. Um, so that you can, you know, spend some time doing a page turn and looking at figures and that that sort of thing in person. And so we have documents at Springville, Spanish Fork, and Mapleton City Halls. We also have a copy at um, the UDOT Region 3 offices in Orem. And then we have a copy uh, here in West Valley City at the UDOT headquarters offices. Um, so once the public comment period ends on November 13th, then we'll move into processing all the comments that receive, we receive either um, through email, through um, posting on the project map, the voicemail comments that we receive tonight. We'll be transcribing those comments and then providing responses. Um, we'll finalize those comments. We'll, we'll make any changes to the document that we need to as a result of any comments that people provide. And then our goal is to publish um, the finalized EA as well as a decision document in early January. We do anticipate at this point um, selecting the preferred alternative. Um, and if we, if we did do that, the next step for us um, as an agency would be moving into the final design phase. After that, um, we would start acquiring right of way and then um, eventually we would move into the construction and then finally maintenance phase of this project. And now at this point in time, I'm gonna turn it over to Darren and he's gonna talk a little bit about the phasing elements for this preferred alternative. Thanks, um, as Alisa has mentioned, we anticipate uh, this EA that we're discussing tonight to be completed sometime uh, in January of next year. At that point, we're gonna move into the design phase. And during the design phase, we will develop detailed uh, information and design for the off ramps, the new frontage roads, and any tie-ins to the, inter to the uh, corridor. At about the 30% design level, which is where we have a better idea of where exactly the alignments and, and both horizontal and vertical will uh, go, then we will begin the right-of-way acquisition process. We've already met with 
several property owners uh, in the area, um, pretty much all of them. And if there are tenants on some of those properties, we will be meeting with them at this time as well um, as we begin to acquire uh, right away. We anticipate this design process lasting somewhere between 12 and 15 months, which would put us somewhere in this timeframe of the spring of 2022. <clears throat> and due to funding limitations, uh, the construction phase will probably be broken out into three phases. The first of those phases would be to construct a diamond interchange utilizing the existing structure. Uh, the existing structure over I-15 is only about 10 years old, so we're trying to get some additional life out of that structure before replacing it. Additionally, as part of this first phase, the southbound on-ramp and northbound off-ramps will tie directly into I-15. Uh, in other words, the, the auxiliary lanes that we identify in the preferred alternative won't be built at that time, uh, but they will be built in a later phase. Uh, the on and off ramps for the new interchange will require us to realign the frontage roads on the northwest, southwest, and northeast quadrants of the interchange. And finally, to ensure safety uh, in this first phase, we will provide improvements to the shoulder widths along the corridor. In phase two, which is currently not funded, we anticipate that this phase will be constructed somewhere between the year 2025 and 2030. And during this phase, we would construct a bridge over the railroad and also adjust the access roads for the businesses that are adjacent to this new railroad bridge. Phase three, uh, which is also not funded, uh, and as such, we don't know the time frame for the construction of this phase, but we will continue to work with the local governments uh, and other stakeholders to determine the funding and timing for this phase. Uh, this phase will include replacing the existing diamond interchange with a spooey interchange as we've talked about, uh, which will extend the life of this project well into the future. Um, and this uh, will require removing and replacing the existing bridge over I-15. We will also construct the northbound and southbound auxiliary lanes between US-6 and the new interchange. And we'll widen the corridor to five lanes with 10 foot shoulders between Main Street and SR 51. Uh, we will also construct sidewalks on the north side of the corridor and construct a multi-use trail on the south side of the corridor. Just wanted to remind everybody that the specific details of the cross section of this corridor will be determined as we go through the design process. Many safety features will be considered during that process and uh, many uh, multi-use factors uh, will be considered. Uh, safety will be paramount to the design. And so we'll be designing uh, features into the project that will en uh, enhance the safety of both the, the traveling public and the pedestrians and bicyclists. So to summarize, the construction of the preferred alternative will occur in three phases with construction of the first phase beginning sometime in the year 2022. Uh, with phase two and three following in subsequent but unknown years at this time, with most of the improvements along the corridor taking place in phase three. Hey, thanks, Darren. Um, as a reminder, the presentation itself is loaded on the current website you can look under the EA and Supporting Materials tab to review that. We're also recording this so you can watch it at a later time or you can share it with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anybody that may be interested. The environmental document, Elisa talked about physical locations where you can find that. You can find a digital copy of it tonight, either on our website or in that same EA and Supporting Materials tab below your video screen. Uh, we're gonna move into the verbal portion of our meeting, the verbal comments, the open mic segment. There are two, it looks like in the queue, but wanna give you some reminders. The first reminder is that um, when you call in, there is a lag time and you will hear a difference between what you're seeing on your screen and what you hear in the recording. It's a lot like calling a radio station, about 30 to 90 second lag time. So go ahead and turn your speakers down uh, or mute those. Um, dial 855-925-2801 
and then follow the instructions that are on the screen. We're going to leave those on the screen. Just also want to give you some additional reminders. Make sure you state your name and spell it so that we can get it accurate in the record tonight. And then voice recordings will be limited to three minutes. We'll play those back. We'll also give some gap time in there. So you might hear some awkward silence, uh, no presentation, no recordings. We wanna make sure we give adequate time for people to um, call in, leave a recording and for us to play it over the next 45 minutes of, of the meeting. Uh, make sure you give your first and your last name. That's also very important when you call in. Um, the verbal comments that are recorded tonight will be um, documented and published in the EA with responses. That'll come out sometime in January. The, I see I'm watching the chat and the uh, verbal comments come in. There's a lot of chat going on. We'll be monitoring this and responding to chat. So feel free back and forth. Hopefully the presentation was informative, but if you continue to have questions, feel free to post them. If we're not able to answer them tonight, we will post answers on our website next week. And if you weren't able to ask your question tonight, feel free to call our hotline or send us an email um, after this meeting and, and we'll be happy to reach out to you and answer your questions as best we can. Um, Want to jump in, I think, and start playing the recordings. It looks like we have two of them in there now. We'll also, um, during some of that gap time, if we don't get a lot of recordings, we will be doing, we've got a panel available. We have a number of frequently asked questions. As I look at the chat that's coming in, some of the questions that we intend to answer with the panel are in the chat. Um, so we'll be answering those off and on, but again, want to give plenty of time for people to call in, um, leave the recording and to allow us to play it back. So what I'd like to do is, um, go ahead and jump over and we'll play the two that I can see in the queue now and encourage you, if you're interested to call and leave a message, but also want to remind you, if you don't want to leave a recorded message tonight, you can still provide written comments through email, through mail and through the website. Let's go ahead and play our first uh, two comments that have come in. My name is Adam Kropp. My question is, if everything goes perfectly with engineering plans, uh, funding, when is the earliest you think this project would begin construction? Would it be one year, two years, three years? My name is Adam. I have uh, two questions. One, it says that there'll be a six foot sound wall put up to help with the noise reduction. Uh, I look back to that road of 1600 South and I don't feel that a six foot sound wall will be sufficient. Um, our houses are built a couple feet above grade as is uh, due to the high water table. And I think that we need a higher than a six foot sound barrier. Also, uh, I wanted to know what the odds or chances are that this road does not get built at all. Is there any possibility that that will happen? Thank you.
Okay, we don't have any um, recordings in the queue right now. We had the two that we played. If you're interested in leaving a verbal comment, please follow the instructions on your screen. I want to go through a few reminders, then we'll go to it. We'll jump to a Q&A with our live panel here in a moment if we don't have any new voice recordings that have come in. Just some quick reminders. Um, I see a lot of chat dialogue happening. Please continue to chat. We'll be monitoring it. It'll be live through 7.30 to the bulk of the meeting. Um, that chat will not be included in the final EA. If you want your comment, and a lot of them when I read them look like they could be comments, um, make sure you send us an email or you jump on tonight, leave a verbal comment, or you can place a comment on our website on the interactive map, or you can even write it down or type it up and mail it in. There's addresses provided under the how to comment tab uh, below the video screen tonight. So, um, Going to double check, make sure we don't have any that have come in. And if we haven't, want to introduce you to maybe one new panelist and then we'll go from there. So I don't see any that have come in. Why don't we bring the panel on screen and let's go ahead and answer a question. I, I see this question coming up in chat. Um, you've already met Darren Bunker, our UDOT project manager. You've met Elisa Alberry, um, our UDOT program or environmental program manager, Ryan Pitts, who is our environmental engineering consultant. We also have Brian Atkinson with us tonight, who is our environment, our, sorry, our engineering lead on the consulting side, um, overseeing the design. And so what I'd like to do, you guys, is maybe jump to what I think looks like the most commonly asked question. It's one we received throughout the study. Darren and Brian, I think it's probably something asked uh, to you guys. It's also something that I'm seeing coming in tonight through the chat feature. So there's a lot of inquiry, a lot of questions. People want to understand why we, um, why we're not extending the study all the way to US 89 and what might be the timeline for that as well. When would we look at that? So why didn't we look at it as part of the study and when would we look at that? Darren, could you take a moment, maybe talk about that and Brian, maybe add to that a little bit, make sure we get that answered tonight. Sure. Um, the reason why we're not extending the, the corridor from uh, SR 51 over to 89 is because that has been identified as a separate project in the uh, Mountain Land Association of Governments Regional Transfer Transportation Plan or RTP. Uh, that is identified as a separate project and so it will have a separate study uh, with it. In addition, as I mentioned in the presentation, we have analyzed the 2050 traffic patterns and through that analysis, we've determined that uh, SR51 is a logical place to end this particular project based on those traffic volumes in 2050. So we are aware of the concerns that um, in order for people to reach the Mapleton area, they will be finding routes from SR51 over to US 89 and that'll be through local streets. We understand that some of those local streets may not be sufficient uh, for the increased traffic. So we will continue to, to look at that and potentially come up with some uh, short-term solutions so that we don't cause uh, additional problems on those local streets. Yeah, I might just <clears throat> add to what Darren's saying there. And you know, as, as Darren mentioned, when we looked at our traffic analysis and our, our traffic model that we created for this project and study, we looked at those north-south corridors, Main Street and SR51, and we looked to check to see that, that we weren't causing any increased problems by stopping our study where we did. And when we looked at our model and evaluated that, like Darren mentioned, we just didn't see any uh, problems that, that warranted needing to go further east over to SR89. Uh, the traffic worked uh, well, and, and, and so that's why we chose to end the study um, where we did. Brian, I wanna ask you a follow-up while you're there. Um, getting some questions and, and we've received some questions throughout. So not only have we not extended it, but we've kind of determined kind of an endpoint or a connection to State Street 
with the current 1600 corridor, what kind of impact or effect will that have on that extension from that location forward? Are we, are we predetermining a location or an alignment or anything like that with what we've done to date? No, that's a great question, Bo. And, and the two studies are really gonna be very independent. Where our study ends, it's not predetermining anything for the future or next study that goes over to SR89. They're, they're gonna be free to look at that and, and decide where they want that connection to be, regardless of where we're showing our connection ending today. Okay, thank you. Um, wanted to do some reminders about verbal comments quick. This would be considered like an open mic segment of a meeting. Obviously, you know, we're online tonight. It's not your standard in-person public meeting. But if we were standing around a table talking, you know, looking at maps and answering questions, uh, we'd strongly be encouraging you to provide comment. You know, walk over, fill out a comment form and stick it in a box that we can um, address in the, in the final EA when it's published in January. Want to do the same tonight. Um, two ways to do that. Tonight would be a verbal comment or you can shoot us an email. Um, you can also submit a comment through the study website or you can mail it to us. If you wanna submit a verbal comment, the instructions are on the screen. We're going to keep taking um, or kind of fitting in some questions with the panel, some frequently asked questions that we've received. If we don't receive um, any more verbal comments, will likely um, end the meeting a few minutes early, but we do have a number of frequently asked questions that have come in and we wanna to try to get through some of those. And I'm, I'm watching the chat as well. And I think many of the questions on our list where we've already talked to a number of people, we had our scoping meeting early on and we've talked to a number of property owners, work closely with the cities as well. We have a pretty good feel for some of these questions and just wanna make sure we can answer them as best we can. But I also wanna strongly encourage you to submit them as comments. That way they make it into the document and the team will respond in writing and they'll be part of that long-term record for this study. So I don't see any more voicemails in the queue. Let's go ahead and go to our next question. Um, Elisa, I think this one's going to go to you. A lot of questions tonight. You've already presented on noise. You may have answered their questions, but there's a lot of dialogue in the chat about the height of the wall. You know, why is it eight feet? Why is it only six feet? Um, I think if you could go back through a little bit of the noise um, that you talked about already and maybe try to talk about how we determine noise wall heights. And I think even maybe at the end of your answer, talking about um, when this would be built, reminding people what phase it is in and, and when it would come about would be good as well. Do you mind talking about noise? No, I'd be happy to. Um, well, I'll just start by saying that noise is a relatively complex um, subject matter. And um, I, I think as a, a resident, I know I've been directly impacted by noise and, and it's, it cannot be pleasant. And um, as an, that's my, my personal experience with it, but from an agency perspective, you know, we do our best to try to mitigate um, noise impacts and try to um, build walls to, to mitigate those impacts. And so um, in doing noise studies, we tend to look at not just one solution, but we look at lots of different combinations. And so um, it, it doesn't really apply to this project, but if you were um, in some area where maybe there was a long noise wall and we couldn't get that one to work, we may try to break it up into different segments just so that we can try to get noise mitigation to work because we do feel like as an agency, it's important that um, we do try to provide as much benefit to the public as we can. You know, we are trying to accommodate traffic and those types of things, but we do want to make our our um, our roads still livable for people that are along those areas. So specific to this um, project in particular, we, and, and I did talk about this um, in the slide where we are proposing one noise wall that goes along 1600 um, south and it goes from 950 west on the east side to uh, just past the houses um, on 10, 1075 west um, to the west. So it's going to be a noise wall that's in two segments, obviously divided by 
um, 1075 West because we can't build a, a wall over a road. Um, but we looked at um, a range of noise wall heights for this area. And we looked at barrier heights that ranged between six and 14 feet in, um, in total height. We have, um, as part of the UDOT noise policy, a couple different criteria that we use to determine whether we would actually propose to build a wall. And the first um, is whether a wall is what we call feasible. Um, we look at engineering feasibility. In other words, can we build it? Is it safe? Those types of things. And then we move into um, a, a criteria we call acoustic feasibility. In other words, like from a noise, the noise standpoint, is it feasible? And so for walls that range um, between six and 14 feet, we found that those were all acoustically feasible, that they would provide a five decibel reduction for the impacted noise receptors in that area. Then the next thing we move on to is, can we, um, uh, can we meet a noise design criteria? And that means, can we provide um, a seven decibel reduction for at least 35% of the front row receptors? And again, this gets really mathematical. It's, it's all detailed in our policy, but this is the process that we have to go through um, to determine whether we would construct a wall. And our, our policy is made consistent with the federal regulations associated with noise. So we found that um, we do have acoustic feasibility for, um, or, or we can meet the noise abatement design goal for, again, for the six to 14 feet wall. And, and so then the next thing we do is work into the, um, the reasonableness criteria, or I'm, I'm sorry, the noise abatement criteria is part of reasonableness. So then we move into the cost reasonableness factor. And um, per our policy, we allow $30,000 per um, impacted property in order to provide mitigation. And so we found that all of these walls were, they met all the criteria, right? So we are able to bring the noise um, volume, if you will, down and um, to the two different criteria, five decibels and seven decibels. And then we can also do it for the cost amount that's allowed. And so then the next thing that we do is we say, okay, UDOT has a, a practice that we only build, we don't build walls taller than they need to be, right? We need to comply with our policy and provide mitigation to those residences or um, areas of frequent outdoor human use like parks and uh, those types of things. And so for this case, the six foot tall wall does meet all those requirements. And so that's the shortest height wall that would provide mitigation for the noise impacts here. And one thing that I would um, just like to touch on that we didn't uh, deal with in my presentation is that we are anticipating that the future noise conditions, so when we when we build this road, that the, the sound would be 67 decibels for those impacted um, properties along 1600 South. So, we define impact as occurring at 66 decibels. So you're really only one decibel over what we define as impact. And um, as a result of putting in the wall, we're anticipating bringing down for at least 46%. So almost half of those front row receivers bringing down the, the noise sound level to um, by seven decibels. So you're now looking at, you know, uh, 60 decibels, which is um, six decibels below where your impact would be. So we do think we've got the design right on the noise wall, and that's why we're proposing to go with the six decibels. Um, Bo, I think you asked a question about when would we build this noise wall? So that would be part of the, the full build out associated with whenever we were doing the widening of the 1600 South Corridor. And so if I'm not mistaken, and maybe Darren can weigh in if I speak incorrectly, but that would be in phase three of construction of this project. And I'm, I don't recall exactly what year we anticipate that happening. That's correct, Alisa. Um, the, the year it would be in phase three and the year that that would happen is uh, not determined at this point. Hey, thanks, Elisa and Darren. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, still no 
comments, no verbal comments in the queue. Want to go back to an awkward moment of silence here for a minute. I want to make sure that people that would like to leave a verbal comment get that opportunity and, and aren't missing out on part of the presentation or part of this Q&A component. So we're going to give them a few minutes um, to call in. It will be silent. You'll just see the screen as it is. And then we'll jump back on, do some reminders, and we'll go to our next question in our frequently asked question list. So let's give it just a minute. If you're interested, please follow the prompts on the screen to call in and leave your comment. Okay, it looks like we have a verbal comment in the queue. While we wait for that to get loaded and ready, I'm wondering, Elisa, could you talk a little bit about meaningful comments and what kind of comments are helpful as part of this process? And then we'll go ahead and play that recording afterwards. Sure, Bart, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, I don't know how many people who are on the call have participated in one of these environmental processes before. Um, a lot of times they can, uh, for, for simple processes, maybe they're a little bit shorter, but sometimes for large projects, they can go on for years, even though we do our best to be really efficient with how we um, prepare them and do any designs and interact with the public and that sort of thing. But often um, throughout these processes, we have a couple different points where we do ask that um, we want the input from the public. We want input 
from um, maybe our federal partners or um, resource agencies that would have jurisdiction over things like wetlands and threatened endangered species. And so um, when we when we reach out in these cases, um, you know, and, and this hearing is a good example of that, we um, are really wanting kind of thoughtful comments from the public and, and people in general do a really great job. Um, just looking at the chat that we're following along, there are some really, really thoughtful comments there. What's really helpful for us as a project team um, is that, that people continue to think about that. And when you submit a written comment, you know, it's not super helpful if, if there's something that you are, if you are just opposed to a project, let's say, if you write it and say, I vote no. Um, this the NEPA process is a is a public disclosure process and it's about um, doing analysis and sharing information with the public kind of documenting everything that we did to get to some conclusion. Um, and unfortunately, we can't have a, a yes no vote associated with that so when you are providing your comments when you're doing the chat or even if you take some time and 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 spend some time maybe reviewing this document, or even if you just look at the executive summary, which we've posted um, on the project webpage. And then if you have some, some thoughts, you know, kind of be thorough with your comments that you're providing instead of just saying, I vote yes or I vote no. You know, can you be a little bit more um, uh, thoughtful or contemplative? in terms of what you're asking of us, because part of our job is to provide information back to you that you have questions on. And um, this is a very, the, the hearing that we're having, the scoping meeting that we had is a very important part of the process that we complete um, to comply with um, you know, numerous federal laws and regulations, but it's also good business for the Department of Transportation that we are trying our best to serve you. And so we want to know from you what's really important to you. So if you have any questions, um, now's the time to ask them. And um, we just really hope that you um, take the time to provide some input to us so that we can get you the information that you need. Thanks, Elisa. I, I'd like to just add on to that if I could as well. Um, as, as Elisa mentioned, we are monitoring, team, monitoring a lot of the questions that are coming in. And I just want to assure everyone that uh, throughout this process of determining what some of the alternatives could be and, and coming up with a preferred alternative, we've already discussed uh, many, many questions. And uh, we will be using the questions that are coming in as part of our future team discussions, uh, not only as part of this EA process, but also as we get into the design phase of the project, uh, we will continue to uh, look back at these questions and make sure that we're addressing uh, all the needs of, the, the, of everyone involved, all the stakeholders, and uh, we'll be trying to come up with the best project based on the answers to those questions. So we'll, we appreciate your, your input and your participation and, uh, and the comments, the thoughtful comments that you provide. So thank you. Thank you, Darren and Alicia. We do have one more uh, voice comment that's come in, a verbal comment that we want to play. Uh, I want to remind everybody there's about 15 minutes left in the meeting. If we don't get additional uh, voice recordings coming in, we will end a little bit early. We may be able to hit on one more um, Q&A as well with our panel, something that's been asked kind of regularly and I'm seeing it in the um, chat and we've talked or, or heard it prior. I'm also seeing a second comment, um, verbal comment coming in right now. And so we're gonna go ahead and play both of those. And then we will have a moment of silence after they play for anyone that would like to can call in. We want to make sure you get this opportunity. Again, there's about 15 minutes left in our meeting. Now's the time to call in and leave a recording if you want your verbal comment played into the meeting. Let's go ahead and play those now. Hi, my name is Corey. I'm calling in wondering if the two rail lines would actually be joined with one so that we only need one overpass. Thanks.
Hi, my name is Logan Millsap. That's L-O-G-A-N-M-I-L-L-S-A-P. Um, I am particularly curious about the pedestrian slash bike, the cyclist improvements to 1600 South in conjunction with this project. Um, I am worried about the fact that these improvements aren't scheduled to take place until like, you know, 10 or 20, or 10 or 15 years from now. Um, I know a lot of people already use that road for cycling, for commuting to and from work, for recreation. Um, it seems to me that the construction of off ramps without improvements to the road, you know, real, real improvements, not, not just shoulder widening would, uh, very much reduce the use of that road for pedestrians and cyclists. And so I would hope that maybe instead of kind of going through this project without being, um, let's see, how to say this? I would hope that instead of doing this project in such a long, drawn-out, uh, multi-phase uh, way, maybe we could wait some time and just kind of do it all at once. And um, then we, we could also coordinate that with the connection to Highway 89 that people are very worried about. Um, uh, maybe you can address these in, in the public hearing, but if not, uh, thanks so much for your time. We want to thank those of you who called in and left uh, comments through the voice recording. Um, also want to remind you that we are not responding to those tonight. We will respond to those in the document. They will be, uh, they are considered and will be included as formal comments in the document with the response and that will be posted or published in January. Uh, want to go ahead maybe and jump to another question. This might be the last one that we get to tonight. I uh, also want to strongly encourage you, if you want to leave a voice recording, now's the time to do it. We'll answer this question with our panel and then um, see if we have additional voice recordings. If we don't, we'll do a quick wrap up and um, really appreciate those that have participated tonight and, and helped with this meeting. Uh, let's talk about right away. I think Brian and Darren is probably for you guys. A lot of questions coming in about right away. We talked about in the presentation, so I don't know how much detail we need to go into, but it looks like in the questions we're getting through the chat and some of the questions we received in advance. Um, I know we've done a lot of work reaching out to property owners, you know, over the last six or seven months. I know we've met with most of those that have um, significant impacts. I know our design isn't done. But we're getting some questions about tenants. I know Elisa showed that slide that had the three tenants that were impacted. Um, could you guys talk a little about the right-of-way process, 
Um, and if they have questions, how to get a hold of us, how to get some answers to those questions now. Yeah, we, we appreciate those questions. We, we realize that there are some tenants uh, that will be impacted by this project. Um, and uh, would like to just have you, if you have uh, questions to get hold of myself, um, and then I will put you in touch with, with uh, our right away agents uh, so that you can understand uh, what the process will be and what some of your options are. Um, and we can do that sooner uh, than later. We don't have to wait. I, I mentioned a 30% design uh, and we would be in that uh, arena or, or that time frame, probably the middle of next year. Uh, but you don't need to wait that long. You can get hold of myself and then I'll get you in touch with a, a right away agent so that uh, you can get some comfort onto what will be happening through this process. Do you have anything to add, Brian? Yeah, so, you know, as Darren mentioned, um, we'll be completing this environmental assessment uh, at the end of this year in, into January. Um, once that's completed, well, UDOT's planning to move into uh, design for that first phase of the project. And we've met with those who are impacted by uh, that first phase of the project. So if you have questions about whether you're impacted or not by the project, and if we haven't met with you, I'd encourage you to you know, get on our website, look at the maps and things we have posted on there. If you're not able to determine that, you know, call our hotline, send us an email. Like Darren mentioned, we're happy to take the time to come and meet with you and make sure we get you the information you need so that you understand, you know, how this affects you for those who live adjacent to or along this, this project and this corridor. And, you know, next year is really, 2021 is going to be, uh, a lot of design going on. Um, once the design gets to a stage where right away impacts can be determined, then um, those designs will be taken to our right away team who will, who will look into getting appraisals done and appraisal reviews done. And so there's a lot of work that'll go on before actual offers are made to property owners for any property that's needed. And so, um, that all is going to take place in 2021. But as Darren mentioned, you know, give us a call, give on our hotline or, and we'll get Darren hooked up with our right-of-way agent. So, so we can get you some better information and, and talk specific to you um, for the timeline that, that, that will be used for, for any acquisition needed for any of your property. Thank you, Brian and Darren. I really like Brian's advice reach out to us. There's a question in the chat about, you know, our plan for where a potential business might go. We have experts that help us with this on all of our projects. We can connect you with the right person and they can walk you through that process um, and help answer those questions. I think that's the best. I'm not seeing any more voicemails in the queue. Um, we're about five minutes till the end of the meeting. I think what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up. I'm going to go through some reminders. If you want to leave a smell again, now's the time to do it. Um, well, since we have a couple minutes, maybe I could address uh, a couple of the questions that came in. I know that's not the purpose of this, but if we were in person, we'd probably be talking about it. And, and those questions have to do with the railroads that are running through the project. Uh, I just want to let everybody know that there is a, a another project uh, in the area to consolidate the two railroad tracks that are crossing 1600 South. Um, and our project team is working with the project team that is um, working on that consolidation. And so our objective is, is that when we do build a bridge over the railroad tracks, it will actually span a, a double track, which will be the consolidated uh, railroads. Um, and so just be aware that we are uh, working with that team uh, to kind of um, identify how that happens and when that happens. 
Uh, they are also working under uh, with an underfunded uh, project. And so they are looking for additional money uh, to accomplish that. And uh, I, I think that'll probably be happening about the same time uh, we're doing phase one of our project. So just wanted to mention that because there been, were a few questions about that in the chat. So thank you. Okay, thanks Darren for answering that. Um, about four minutes till the end of our meeting, we're gonna go ahead and start wrap up. Um, wanna remind everybody that this has been recorded and we will post it on our website. Uh, either later this week or early next week, you can visit the website and look for uh, the recording that you can also share with friends and family or colleagues, anybody that might be interested and were unable to attend tonight. Um, you can review the EA and the supporting documents on our website as well, or on the tab below for EA and supporting materials. All the information we presented tonight is there, uh, as, long, as well as some additional information Ryan talked about during his um, presentation a little bit about, we have a 3D animation that's there that showcases what this would look like when the final build out is complete. And then we also have a story map. If you go to the story map, it's interactive and you can scroll down and we have text boxes that pop up that will showcase the preferred alternative in more detail. I strongly encourage you to um, look at both of those on the website or in that um, tab below for supporting materials. and. That way you can get maybe some of your questions answered as well. And it looks like we've been able to answer most of the questions that have come in tonight. If additional questions come in that we aren't able to get to, we will post a transcript, um, kind of the question that came in as well as our response on our website uh, next week as well. Our comment period as a reminder is extended through November 13th. And you can submit comments after tonight um, via email on our website, or you can mail those in. There's a tab below on how to comment with all those details, as well as that information is on our website. All written and then the verbal comments that were provided tonight will be included in um, the final EA, which will be published in January. And you can look in the document, you'll be able to see your question and we'll be responding to that. So you can see our response to that as well. Um, last thing I want to remind everybody of, we are asking for feedback. This online format is new, we appreciate you joining us and participating tonight. If you could take a few minutes and tell us how we could improve. We'd love any input that we can. There's a tab below the recording for post-event survey. Please click on that, take a few minutes and submit that. Just wanna thank everybody for joining us. And if you have any other questions, feel free to call our hotline or email us after tonight. Thank you very much.